بلد محمد ممكن تبدا السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته اولا ابدا بحمد الله والشكر والثناء لله سبحانه وتعالى والحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله اي ثينك ماي فويس از كلير فور ايفري وان اي واضح واضح نعم First of all, I want to thank King Faisal Hospital, King Faisal Specialist Hospital, and Dr. Ayim Haid specifically for moderating this presentation and all the speakers for this today night. First case will be a case of neonate with abdominal distension, and Dr. Ali he chose a title for this is a night of big big bellies. So we we'll start with the first case, the neonate with abdominal distension. Uh, the supervisor is Dr. Ali Al Mahedib, and uh, Dr. Ben Agil. Uh, I, I think Dr. Abdelaziz Ben Agil. He will be the uh, presenting of the case. You can go now. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Hayakum Allah. The جميع فرصة طيبة أن أتقابل في هذا اليوم. شكرا دكتور محمد على المقدمة وعلى الترتيب المتميز وكذلك الدكتور ظافر الشهري على الترتيب الأمور التقنية والشكر موصول للدكتور معاذ التريكي على جهوده في إدارة الجمعية Tonight we will be presenting two cases These are two extremes of pediatrics One in unit with progressive abdominal distinction it will be presented by Dr. Abdul Aziz bin Agil. He is a second year fellow. And the second will be a 13 year old with progressive abdominal distinction also. We elected to use balls in this meeting. Uh, so all participants will be sharing with us, you know, uh, their thoughts and different, you know, approach to these cases in order to come to you know, uh, scientific uh, conclusions. And I will uh, invite Dr. Abdelaziz bin Agil now to present the first case. Dr. Abdelaziz, tafadhal. Thank you, Dr. Ali. The uh, slides are clear? Yes, it's clear, Dr. Ali. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, today, inshallah, I will be presenting uh, an interesting topic, abdominal distension, uh, a challenging uh, and, and uh, an interesting case. So uh, our case today is about a newly admitted uh, patient in the intensive care unit. Uh, the patient is a uh, three weeks old baby girl, gestational age is 36 weeks product of cesarean section. Uh, her, bait, her birth weight was uh, 3.8 kg. The antenatal history is significant for severe polyhydraminous that required amniotic fluid reduction. And the fluid was sent for chromosomal analysis, which came back uh, normal. The maternal history, uh, the mother is a 28-year-old lady, medically and surgically free. She's a gravida three, para two, with no significant history of fetal loss or neonatal death. Uh, in the perinatal uh, screening, uh, negative, it was negative for hepatitis B serology and group B streptococcus. The mother blood group is O positive, as well as the baby is also O positive. There is no significant history of consanguinity and uh, CMV titer and parvovirus B19 screening tests were both IgG positive and IgM negative. Uh, regarding the birth and labor and delivery management, the patient was delivered vigorous uh, and cried immediately after birth. The APGAR score was nine and nine at one and five minutes respectively. Upon the postnatal care, uh, it was noticed that the, uh, the, that the baby was having uh, an abdominal distension which shortly started uh, to progress and the patient started to progressively having respiratory distress, required intubation and was admitted to the NICU. In the NICU, uh, the patient uh, respiratory uh, condition deteriorated and required higher respiratory support reaching to high frequency ventilation. 
given that the, pa the baby was having abdominal distension, respiratory compromisation now, uh, limited ultras uh, ultrasound was done and was uh, was found to have a significant ascites. Peritoneal fluid tapping was done to alleviate the compression on the lungs and 100 ml of fluid was drained. After stabilization, the initial physical examination showed no clear dysmorphic features in the baby, uh, but there was a left lower limb hemihypertrophy that was clear upon examination. In the chest examination, there was a decreased air entry bilaterally with crepitation, uh, while the patient was in high frequency of ventilation. Uh, the heart examination was significant of continuous machinery murmur that was heard in the left upper sternal border. And the abdominal examination showed a distended, tense abdomen with the visible dilated veins. Also, there was a left side reducible inguinal hernia, no skin discoloration or rashes. Uh, as the patient had uh, worsening respiratory condition and a significant murmur, urgent postnatal uh, echo was done, which showed subpulmonary mass rising from the ventricular chamber, large PDA, severe pulmonary hypertension, and small ASD. The initial labs upon the admission to the NICU uh, was done. This is the CBC with differential. Uh, as we can see, the CBC uh, showing that uh, the baby have uh, uh, the WBC and homoglobin in the lower side, specifically the absolute neutrophil count and the absolute uh, lymphocyte count. In the chemistry, uh, uh, including uh, renal function and liver function test, showed uh, low uh, albumin uh, for, uh, for the patient. So after that, uh, after uh, elevating uh, the proteinal fluid with paracentesis, the patient's respiratory condition uh, started to improve, and he was switched from high frequency to conventional ventilation. Feeding with increment was started on the second day of life with good tolerance and normal bowel movement, and the acetic fluid that was drained uh, upon admission was sent for analysis, and this is the result of the analysis. Uh, as you can see uh, here, uh, we will have now uh, our first poll question. Given the result of the fluid analysis, what will be your next action? Would you calculate the SAG and start the protein and start the patient on diuretics, or send the fluid for culture and start uh, broad spectrum antibiotics, or consult pediatric surgery? Okay. As we can see that 63% uh, would like to calculate the SAG and start the patient on diuretic. 33% uh, uh, of the patient, uh, of the audience elected to send the fluid for culture and start on broad spectrum antibiotic. And 4% would like to consult pediatric surgery. Uh, okay, continuing, the, the acetic fluid uh, was, uh, came back positive for uh, streptococcus viridens, which was started, uh, which the patient was started and completed a 10-day course of vancomycin, ampicillin, and denosolid. During that time, the patient was kept NPO and on TPN. She started uh, to improve from the respiratory point of view. However, her abdominal distension remains the same. Our next poll uh, would be what's the most likely cause of her ascites given uh, what we have until now of information. Is it congenital, infectious, traumatic, or cardiac? Okay. 
the majority are uh, saying that it is 67% actually is going with congenital and uh, a good percentage, 21% is going with infectious. 13% uh, uh, also uh, considering cardiac as a cause uh, for uh, this ascites. To elaborate more uh, on the answer of the question, uh, we're going to have a little talk about uh, neonatal ascites. So the term uh, ascites derives from a Greek word, uh, which is ascites, which means bag-like. And as, as we know, ascites is, is the abnormal buildup of fluid in the abdominal cavity. And chylus ascites referred to the accumulation of lipid-rich lymph in the peritoneal cavity as uh, secondary to uh, disruption of the, of the lymphatic system, either due to traumatic injury, obstruction, or any other uh, uh, causes. Going back to the physiology, uh, as we know, the lymph is composed from protein, lymphocyte, immunoglobulins, and lipids in the form of chylomicrons. So, and uh, actually, uh, that's why uh, the patient who is having chylus ascites uh, is having milky, cloudy uh, fluid in the peritoneal cavity. And this is what's happening to our patient. If you remember the analysis that came back cloudy and milky. Uh, because of the lipid-rich uh, content of the fluid. And uh, as we know that in the gut, when we absorb our fat, the long-chain triglycerides are converted to monoglyceride and free fatty acid. And these got, uh, or, or these get absorbed in, as chylomicrons and then to the lymphatic system. On the other hand, short and medium chain triglycerides, they are absorbed directly in the portal venous system and not going uh, through the, the lymphatics. And this is maybe a basis of like nutritional management that we will going to discuss later. That's why medium chain uh, triglyceride is uh, preferred as a modality of nutritional management in these patients who's having chylus ascites. So usually patients with chylus ascites, their uh, uh, proteinial uh, or the proteinal fluid or ascites usually, they have certain characteristics the color would be milky and cloudy. Usually the triglyceride liver in the fluid will be above 200 milligram per deciliter. The cell count will be above 500. And it is usually lymphocytic predominance. Uh, the total uh, protein is between 2.5 to 7 gram per deciliter. The uh, serum acetic albumin gradient, usually it's below 1.1 gram per deciliter. And uh, usually uh, the, uh, the cholesterol, uh, as, as a, we usually take it as a ratio uh, between acetic and serum, and usually it's below one, it will be low. And based on the etiology of the, <coughs> of the ascites, the culture may show, if it is infectious in nature, it may show certain organism, or if it is neoplastic, it can show us plastic cells. Usually the glucose content is below 100 milligram per deciliter. This slide shows us that the differential diagnosis of chylus ascites is actually uh, very broad. And uh, usually making the diagnosis or the reason of the chylus ascites uh, a challenging task. So, uh, but we can maybe subcategorize these uh, differential diagnosis and go from what our patient is presenting uh, with. So usually we can subcategorize them as congenital, infectious, traumatic, neoplastic, or even cirrhosis. Uh, congenital such as primary lymph, uh, lymphatic hypoplasia and Klippertronani syndrome, which is a syndrome that is known to cause uh, hypertrophy uh, of the limbs. Infectious such as tuberculosis and other mycobacterium uh, organisms. Uh, traumatic, uh, actually, it's divided to iatrogenic or even non-surgical. Surgical, if the patient is going for any uh, abdominal surgical uh, repair or even non-abdominal surgical repair, sometimes there could be iatrogenic injury to the lymphatic vessel, causing some leakage or even obstruction. Or blunt trauma, abdominal trauma, sometimes it was reported that patient can present as a secondary uh, chylus ascites. Neoplastic, such as uh, lymphoma and solid organ cancers or carcinoid tumors, can be also a cause of chylus ascites. 
actually uh, the first case of ascites was infectious in origin back in 1800s when uh, a pediatric case, uh, an 11-year-old child was having chylus ascites and he, it was secondary to, to tuberculosis. So as we see, the, the differential diagnosis uh, is very broad and it's very challenging. And a, a, a good diagnostic approach should be first by suspecting the diagnosis. We should always keep in the ba in back of our mind chylus ascites in patients who, who's presenting with abdominal distension, fluid in the pr uh, proteinal cavity. Chylus ascites is always a, a possibility. And if we suspect it, we should confirm it by the presence of chyle in the proteinal cavity by the char characteristics findings uh, that we discussed in regards of the serum albumin uh, acetic ratio gradient, uh, the lymphocytic predominance, the cultures. And after we confirm the presence of chylus ascites, determining, determining the underlying abnormality is the biggest challenge now. And we can tailor our investigation to finally reach our diagnosis based on the symptoms, uh, age of onset, risk factors that the patient is, is presenting with. So uh, after this uh, like brief review on neonatal ascites, let's go back uh, to our patients. <clears throat> the patient underwent a routine ultrasound for preterm neonates, and the ultrasound was significant uh, of multiple tiny subcentimetric uh, bilateral subependymal nodules. And to elaborate more, uh, MRI brain was done, and as you can see in the picture. Uh, we can find bilateral hyperintensity uh, multiple subependymal nodule. The most significant one or the most prominent one are uh, bilateral to the foramen Monroe. And these findings usually are seen in patients with tuberous sclerosis patient. So uh, now just as a recap before going any further, we have we have we have a patient who's who, who is a neonate presenting with uh, hemihypertrophy, uh, chylus ascites, respiratory uh, abdominal distension requiring uh, respiratory uh, support, and also uh, echo was showing a picture of uh, a ventricular uh, mass and an MRI of the brain showing finding of tuberous sclerosis. So because of all these findings and the hemihypertrophy, and our, as we discussed in the back in our differential diagnosis, that uh, um, any uh, congenital or lymphatic, uh, uh, congenital lymphatic uh, malformation can be a possibility. So an intranodal lymphangiogram was done, and it is usually uh, done by injecting a contrast uh, to the uh, uh, lymphatic vessel bilaterally. As, as we can see in this picture, that the contrast in the left uh, limb uh, is not uh, draining through the il uh, left iliac lymphatic vessel, and it is actually refluxing uh, to, to the lower limbs and in the abdomen. Uh, however, the right iliac lymphatic vessels are both intact with normal contrast pattern. So this uh, contrast study suggested that this patient is actually having generalized lymphatic anomaly as a diagnosis, which is adding another manifestation to, to our uh, patient. So is there a relation between tuberous sclerosis and all of these findings, uh, chylus ascites, lymphatic malformation, uh, such a, in a way that this is uh, our neonate patient is presenting with. So a little a brief uh, review about tuberous sclerosis, just a reminder, it, it is an autosomal dominant neurocutaneous disease with a variable expressivity uh, that causes benign tumors that grows in the brain and other, 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 other vital organs such as kidneys, heart, eyes, lungs, liver, and skin. Usually it's caused by mutation to either uh, tuberous sclerosis complex gene one or tuberous sclerosis complex gene two. However, patients usually have de novo mutation and usually it accounts approximately to 80% of tuberous sclerosis uh, cases. 
usually it is more common with tuberous sclerosis mutation in type in gene uh, type 2 more than uh, type 1 and this is the uh, a possible situation our patient and uh, as the both uh, parents are healthy and they are not consanguineous so de novo mutation is very high uh, in, in in tuberous sclerosis uh, okay, what's the relation between uh, tuberous sclerosis and, uh, or from the GI, does, so does tuberous sclerosis have GI manifestation? The answer is yes. Uh, one of the manifestations of tuberous sclerosis and actually one of the diagnostic criteria is lymphangiomyomatosis. Uh, what is this? Uh, it is uh, actually uh, a multifocal lymphatic malformation with systemic uh, distribution. It is seen more commonly with the type two mutation rather than type one. However, it's usually present later in life or later in the course of the disease, actually in the late adolescent or through adulthood. And usually these uh, lymphangiomyomas, uh, uh, usually uh, the complication of it, patient will have chylothorax or chylus ascites and our patient presented uh, with callus ascites. And how does the genetic uh, or the tuberous sclerosis diagnose? As we mentioned, there is a clinical criteria. Uh, there is ma major and clinic minor clinical features, and we need two major uh, and one minor to make a definitive diagnosis of uh, tuberous sclerosis. Now in the genetic era, a gene study can be helpful. However, there is 10 to 25% of tuberous sclerosis. Still, they have no mutation detected, but they are diagnosed through the clinical criteria. In our patient, we have two major criteria, which, is, which makes uh, a, a definitive diagnosis uh, based on this criteria. We have a subependymal nodules, which were seen in the brain MRI, and the lymphangioleomyomatosis, that was uh, manifested as uh, uh, left hemihypertrophy and was seen through the intranodal lymphangiogram, which complicated the chylus ascites. The next question, why, uh, as we mentioned the previous slide, that this is usually appear late in adolescent and late uh, through adulthood. Why is this patient coming just days uh, or on the first day actually he's presenting? We said the, the literature, there is a similar case was reported back in 2015. And uh, the case was to uh, 20, uh, a 23-year-old uh, woman, gravida one preterm, uh, 31 weaker. Uh, the baby was having abnormal ascites and was confirmed through uh, uh, ultrasound, required multiple paracentesis. The neonatal echo showed multiple cardiac masses as, as uh, which is very similar until now to our patients in all this. Our patients also a preterm, uh, having significant ascites and having a cardiac mass. And uh, all, however, this patient was having hypopigmented mac uh, macules in the skin uh, in contrast to our patient who, who did not have any skin manifestations. Okay, management. After uh, explaining uh, the current situation of our patient, how would you like to manage this patient? Would you continue the patient uh, MPO and TPN, or would you rather to start the patient on octreotide infusion, or start MCT oil, or consult surgery to correct the lymphatic malformation? Okay. Okay. Majority will start MCT uh, uh, oil or MCT based formula. Uh, st uh, only 10% will start on extratide infusion and 24% will uh, go for surgery consultation. Actually, all of these uh, are uh, good ideas and can be done for this patient. To discuss the management of chylus ascites, we should categorize the management to nutritional, pharmacological, surgical, 
And of course, treatment of the underlying cause of the chylus ascites is always going to be the mainstay of treatment. Regarding the nutritional treatment, although it is common practice to recommend bowel rest and keep the patient on TPN, uh, there is uh, no definitive evidence supporting one in, uh, like keeping a TPN versus enteral PD. A reasonable approach uh, would be to recommend a high protein, low fat diet with MCT uh, supplementation. And if, if this didn't work, we can now consider bowel rest and uh, keep the patient TPN after the trial of the enteral feeding. Regarding the pharmacological treatment, uh, case reports have suggested that both somatostatin and octreotide, either alone or in combination with TPN, are effective in the management of callus ascites. The mechanism may uh, involve like lymph uh, fluid excretion through a specific receptor from the normal intestinal wall, but uh, all the case reports showing there is a benefit regarding TPN, uh, a combined TPN combination or not. Surgical abdominal paracentesis, usually it is done uh, who, to patients who are either uh, symptomatic that have uh, respiratory uh, compromisation or not responding to treatment, uh, abnormal parasy abdominal paracentesis may be uh, used and may be repeated as the patient needs. What about a, a transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt or TIPS? The use uh, of TIPS has been, has been successfully treated chylus ascites. Uh, however, it is mostly in adult patients or patients uh, who is having uh, chylus ascites secondary to cirrhosis or patients who are resistant to medical therapy uh, or patients requiring multiple abdominal paracentesis. Uh, however, it is not very uh, functional uh, in our patient because, because of the, uh, it's, he's a neonate and technically it's difficult to do it in such a neonate with this uh, size. Porto, uh, peritonovenous shunt. Uh, in the past, uh, peritonovenous shunt was considered an option for, P, uh, for patients who are refractory to medical. Uh, and who are poor candidates for surgery. However, because of this shunt had high, high rate of serious complications such as septus, sepsis, DIC, small bowel obstruction, and even risk of air embolism, their use has been declined over the years. Okay. Aziz, uh, one minute for you to conclude. Hey, I'm almost done. So back to our patient, the patient was kept NPO and on TPN, and he was started an octreotide infusion. Abdominal drain was started as the patient ex was expected to have multiple paracentesis. And the patient after that, abdominal distension improved and extubated to high flow nasal cannula. So this is uh, our next poll. What is the next step in management of this patient? Will we, will we continue NPO or TPN and give more time? Will we start beta blocker? or start serolimus. He is still having ascites improved, but still there. Okay. Okay. Well, most of the audience will start serolimus. And actually, uh, this is what we did. This is just a quick, I, I will not go through this in the, because of sake of time. I'll just mention that this is a case series mentioning the use of serolimus in adult uh, patients. Uh, and uh, like uh, gathered multiple papers starting from two, uh, 2008 until 2017 with significant regression to complete resolution of chylus ascites after the starting of serolimus. So serolimus was started at 0.8 milligram per meter square uh, twice daily, and patient uh, trap level of serolimus was monitored regularly, and the dose was uh, tailored based on the trap level. We were targeting trap level between 4 and 12. After standing the serolimus, the patient drain <laughs> is out, respiratory starts markedly improved. The patient drain was removed. Went to room air, started feeding gradually, and uh, finally discharged at the age of six months. Clinically stable, tolerating oral feeding with follow up with the gastroenterology, neurology, cardiology, medical genetics, and clinical dietitian. 
This is our last poll. Okay, patient improved, started to improve, discharge home at six months. For how long will you treat with Seronimus? Six months, 12 months, 24 months, continue until complete resolution of herzitis. Okay, the majority will continue until complete resolution of ascites. Actually, there is no clear uh, guidance regarding the duration of treatment. Majority, they are treating one to two years or uh, and some even more, that, but there is no clear guidelines or uh, consensus regarding the duration. Our last slide, the patient- I last... think time is done for this case. If you you wouldn't mind uh, to one slide only, one more. This is the last slide, yeah, this is the last slide. Uh, so the patient last visit to our clinic, she is currently two years of age. She is still on serolimus uh, and her serolimus uh, level is within therapeutic. She is gaining weight and height for her age and with significant, with significant improvement of her ascites and even the albumin, as you can see, uh, with the WBC count hemoglobin, all improved after starting her on Seronimus. Thank you, and uh, sorry if I took more than uh, allowed time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Adaziz. Uh, for you, Dr. Ali, if you want uh, one minute to add anything or you will, you will receive one question, up to you. Then you to, you to start the next uh, lecture. Dr. Ali? Tasma'ani al-an? Yeah, yeah, it's clear now. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Abdul Aziz, for this interesting question. I think uh, maybe we can have one question from the audience. If they can share it through chat or they can, you know, voice it. Uh, Anybody has any question? There is one. Anyone? Can I hand the uh, th thank you very much for the uh, beautiful presentation. My question was, uh, may, uh, I might have got disconnected from the beginning of the lecture, but um, uh, what, uh, what, uh, uh, يعني, what was the um, findings, how uh, the ascites was progressively increasing and how it was chylus uh, from, the to from the beginning when uh, it was, uh, uh, was not? Yeah, it was chylus from the beginning, and it was progressive to the extent that this patient needed high-frequency ventilation to start with. After paracentesis, the patient, you know, respiratory status improved, and she was shifted to mechanical ventilation. We were struggling with hair uh, with different modalities using TPN, MPO, then stectorotide, and there was MCT oil-based feeding, no, no improvement. And once she was started in sirolimus, the patient showed dramatic improvement and she was weaned off everything, respiratory support, TPN, and she was discharged. I think this is a, a message that, uh, you know, uh, chylus ascites uh, in neonates can be seen and you need to use cyrolimus, uh, which is uh, recently, you know, uh, used in such presentations. And uh, uh, this is one of the uh, excellent cases. We, it took time for us, it took months to reach to this result. And I am seeing here now in the clinic, she is doing extremely well and the family are happy. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ali. For the next uh, case, also will be supervised by Dr. Ayim Hedib. Uh, this case is a 13 years old uh, boy case for Crohn's disease and progressive abdominal distension. As Dr. Ali, he put the title, The Night of Big Bellies. So we'll proceed with uh, Dr. Ziad Mirza and uh, super, with, supervised with Dr. Alim Hedib. Dr. Ziad, you can proceed in your case. Assalamu alaikum. I hope you can uh, hear, me, hear me now. Yeah, it's okay. So, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, so I'll present, I'll be presenting this uh, interesting case. Uh, so, um, He's a 13 years old uh, Kuwaiti boy. Maybe, no. Dr. Ziad, if you put the mic out of, uh, yani not nearby to the, uh, because uh, there's some only echoes. Um, is it okay now? 
Yeah, yeah, it's better now. Okay, so um, we have a 13 years old uh, Kuwaiti boy, known case of uh, Crohn's disease based on endoscopic biopsy. And um, he was diagnosed at the age of uh, 10 years. Uh, family preferred to keep the patient on alternative medicine therapy uh, since then. So he presented with a uh, right upper quadrant pain, uh, severe, uh, continuous, and uh, continuous and non for uh, this, uh, this disruption. But uh, if you, you can make it mo more bitter, or this is the problem. Okay, Dr. Ziad, you can the mic and put it on the built in microphone. شيل المايك هذا حق الايفون. Uh, how is it now? Yeah, yeah, excellent. Okay, perfect. Uh, so uh, our patient presented with a right upper quadrant pain, which was severe, continuous, and non irradiating, uh, associated with progressive abdominal distension for a few weeks. Uh, he was found to have low hemoglobin and uh, he was admitted and given supported management and uh, part of the system. Uh, the x ray at that point was obtained, and uh, this was his abdominal x ray. So, uh, to make this interactive, uh, can you put the first poll, please? So, uh, what will you do next? Will you obtain a serum chemistry and routine lab, or would you do an abdominal ultrasound, or would you consult surgical team, or you would obtain fecal calprotectin? Okay, excellent. So 50% and the majority said we would proceed with the chemistry and the routine labs. And uh, about 36% said we do abdominal ultrasound. Again, there's nothing, um, there's no wrong and true uh, regarding this uh, scenario, but uh, uh, yeah, we'd proceed with the lab work. So this is the initial lab works um, upon presentation. Uh, his hemoglobin was low and um, his chemistry was unremarkable. His platelet was okay. Uh, he had mild elevation of uh, his uh, transfer magnesis, and uh, his album was 33. INR was 1.3. So uh, abdominal ultrasound was done also, which showed mild sminomegaly with moderate ascites. Uh, patient continued on supportive therapy with no much improvement. So uh, this is the second poll, if you can uh, see it. What will you do next? Would you send uh, fecal for uh, uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin? Would you do CT to evaluate pancreas or would you do albumin scan or would you do paracentesis? Uh, actually, it would be very interesting to know uh, what kind of answer I will get from this uh, poll. Okay. Very interesting. So uh, the vast majority said uh, we do paracentesis, and uh, some said we do CT to evaluate pancreas, and the others, um, no one picked the album scan. Okay. Uh, so uh, we did paracentesis, and uh, this was the result mainly. Uh, hematology and, and culture were sent, which was unremarkable. Um, his album was the serum album was 33, his acetic album was 17 gram per liter, and his acetic protein was 26. So, uh, the next important question is uh, what would be the, the differential diagnosis? And this is really important. So, is it cirrhosis? Is it uh, bad chiari? Or is it pancreatitis? Just take your time because you will need to do some calculation to find this answer. You will not find it immediately. Okay, so uh, we had the results. Uh, both bank attacks and carry syndrome, early bad syndrome are 33% and uh, 
the others was 17 and 17. Okay. So, uh, just to explain which, uh, this is very important actually, uh, we have to calculate the SAG and uh, I'm sure you're very familiar with this uh, diagram. It's actually very important. So um, um, in any patient with ascites, uh, it, it's very important to calculate the SAG because it can direct it towards a certain differential diagnosis. So in our patient, the album was about 3.3 gram per deciliters and the acetic album was uh, about uh, 1.6 uh, 1.7 so the the sag would be 1.6 which is more than 1.1 gram per deciliters and the acidic uh, protein was 2.6 so it, it, it would direct to, towards this structure diagnosis of the previous uh, uh, uh the only uh, answer that would fit is elder syndrome So um, for this patient, back to our patient, he had a sound that uh, looked was done for him and uh, showed non-visualized uh, non uh, flow in the hepatic veins consistent with the uh, bad care syndrome. So based on this, he was started on anticoagulant and he was clinically improving. And he was discharged on anticoagulant. Um, just uh, a interesting question, how would you continue treating this child? If you can, uh, if you can put this call, please. Would you continue on antibiotics? Would you try to treat the underlying cause, which is chronic disease? Would you do angioplasty plus tinting, or would you do tips, or would you do uh, a liver transplant? Again, there's nothing right or wrong, but uh, it's really interesting to know what would you think. Okay, uh, the vast majority said would, would continue treating uh, with the uh, treat Crohn's disease, the underlying cause, and uh, uh, the second uh, answer was anticoagulants. Well, I'll, I'll get through this uh, later, but uh, for now, let's see if, uh, this. So, uh, uh, sorry, this slide is not showing. Okay. So patient was not compliant with anticoagulants and um, uh, and, um, and he stopped uh, after he felt some improvement. He presented again after six months with progressive abdominal distension and right after quadrant pain. Uh, at this presentation, he had low abdominal platelet, elevated plasma mayonnaise, uh, high food anemia, and severe coagulopathy, uh, reaching up to seven, I now seven. CTM uh, in the past uh, showed severely attenuated hepatic veins with no different uh, flow and prominent project flow and then close to thrombus in the superior hepatic segment of IBC. Yeah. 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 Stop the video. I will stop the video and we'll try to learn a few Try now. Sure. Uh, try now. Okay. Is it okay now? Okay. So uh, the patient was referred to our hospital for further workup after um, this CT for further workup and management. Uh, so I will talk a little bit about bad carry syndrome. So bad carry syndrome is defined as non cardiogenic uh, venous outflow obstruction that uh, results in ascites and hepatomegaly. This is the simple definition of bad carry syndrome. And it could be either uh, primary which is the most common, uh, which is caused by thrombones mainly, uh, like in our patient, or secondary by something compressing the hepatic veins from outside, such as uh, abscess or tumor. Uh, so, bad care syndrome can be classified into either acute fulminant uh, bad care syndrome, which is characterized by acute liver injury, uh, with elevated transaminases, jaundice, coagulopathy, and hepatic encephalopathy, and usually it presents within eight weeks. Or acute non fulminate uh, but scary syndrome, um, and here it is, uh, and here from its name, it's usually, uh, it's the symptoms usually develops within a few weeks without uh, any evidence of acute uh, liver failure. And uh, the example uh, for that is the initial presentation of, in our patient. 
and or subacute uh, bad scar syndrome, which uh, symptoms are gradually and can take up to uh, three months usually. Uh, what is interesting in this um, here that usually in this type, the ascites um, and the hepatic necrosis is minimal because the collaterals um, uh, had enough time to develop. So um, this would be a decompressed liver. The liver. Uh, the last type is the chronic uh, Pascal syndrome, and it usually presents with cirrhotic complication, uh, which our patient uh, presented at the end of uh, his presentation. So, Pascari has um, the classical triad, uh, which is uh, ascites, abdominal pain, and hepatomidal. And um, as we mentioned earlier, sometimes they can present with uh, fulminant acute uh, liver failure picture. Uh, the diagnosis is mainly by uh, radiological investigation or radiological diagnosis, and it can be easily picked by um, doing only hepatic uh, ultrasound, Doppler ultrasonography. Um, also, MRI and CT with contrast can, can be done to reach the diagnosis. And of course, uh, searching um, and the underlying cause uh, to do thrombophilia workup. Uh, yeah. So, what is the initial treatment? We should uh, start anticoagulants immediately, and uh, in those types of patients, would require to continue anticoagulants for a really long time. Uh, secondly, treat the underlying cause if possible, and um, and third, treat the complication if there is any complications. So the principle of uh, treating uh, this patient is restoring. Uh, one of them is restoring patency. And this can be done either by uh, thrombolysis or angioplasty plus or minus stinting. Uh, the other important modality of treatment is decompressing the liver. And, um, and this can be done through, uh, through shunting, um, let it be uh, surgical shunting or what is now known as steps. Of course, SIPS has, has now replaced the surgical shunt uh, because it's considered less invasive than um, the surgical shunts. Um, and also high, higher success rates. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so this is, again, uh, this is a good uh, summary uh, regarding the management of uh, bad scary syndrome. Uh, basically, that all patients with blood carry syndrome will need a really long time uh, anticoagulants. All patients, regardless of the presentation, will need uh, this is the first uh, line of treatment anticoagulants. And if you start anticoagulants, which one do uh, with follow up, you notice in that the patient de is developing any signs of water hypertension. Um, so, hepatic pain interventions uh, such as antiplasty with stenting, with stenting can be considered. Um, and of course, if this uh, has failed, you, you can consider doing tips. Or if the patient is presenting with acute fulminant uh, liver uh, failure, you can consider tips from the beginning because uh, the other models of treatment will not help much. Um, but scary syndrome is, and chronic disease is really, really rare. So I, by reviewing the literature, I only found um, uh, one recent adult uh, case report who reported a 27 years old uh, chronic disease, not on any treatment, who developed uh, bad scary syndrome. And uh, this uh, young man was started on steroid and heparin infusion, and he was uh, uh, discharged uh, sorry, long term heparin. Uh, he was discharged long term heparin and uh, also uh, was started on anti PNF. Uh, after that, with follow ups, he was ha found to have patent hepatic veins uh, during his follow ups and his symptoms has improved a lot. So, this is the only literature review regarding Crohn's disease and uh, Rutzkari syndrome. Okay, so. Uh, uh, by doing an intensive literature review, I found um, a pediatric, uh, in the pediatric population, I, I didn't find any specific data about Crohn's disease and uh, Basquiat syndrome, but I found this interesting study, which compared the different modalities of treatment, uh, which was really interesting. So they took uh, 32 patients and uh, they started half of them on, um, on medical management. Um, the failure rate, rate in medical management was about 66%. Uh, 
the medical management consists of uh, only uh, treating with anticoagulants. So this alone was really high, about 66%, and required uh, later on interventional uh, radiology to intervene. Um, angioplasty alone um, had also a high, uh, high failure rate, about uh, three, uh, three out of seven had failed uh, angioplasty alone, and had re-stenosis re re within, within six months. Um, better outcome was achieved if uh, stint was uh, placed. Uh, among those 32 patients, 14 uh, patients underwent TIPS, and uh, the success rate was about uh, 65%. So um, regarding this success rate, they monitored the success of uh, TIPS is by resolution of symptoms, examining the labs, and by repeating ultrasound every three to six months uh, to monitor the latency of uh, the channel. And by using uh, yearly EGD to assess uh, the presence uh, of uh, varices. Um, unfortunately, in their study, they didn't mention anything about hepatic encephalopathy after TIPS, which is considered a very common uh, side effect of uh, TIPS. So, um, uh, in, in summary, just to summarize what is important about uh, Buscara syndrome, um, it is a rare disease uh, and should be suspected in any patient with acute liver failure, progressive ascites, and abdominal pain. Um, if blood scarier syndrome is suspected, other uh, some that needs to be done. And uh, both anticoagulants and angioplasty have high failure rate if used alone. Uh, blood scarier syndrome should be monitored closely with early repair to a uh, transplant center, um, and it, this is highly recommended. Um, just uh, before concluding, in our patient, uh, because he presented the action with uh, uh, decompensating uh, liver disease, and uh, he required a lot of, um, he was really in refractory ascites, so eventually, and severe coagulopathy, so eventually he received a liver transplant recently. Uh, the expanded uh, liver showed uh, congestion, hemorrhagic congestion in zone two and three, which is consistent with blood carrier syndrome. Uh, after the transplant, he's doing fine from the liver point of view. So, uh, yeah, that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ziad. And uh, thank you uh, all of the speakers, Dr. Ziad. And uh, we have uh, maybe five or more, or even six, uh, seven minutes uh, for questions. Please your hand, raise uh, your hands. For sure, on the, um, on the screen. Uh, not, uh, it's virtual. Huh? And uh, Dr. Ali, if you have any comments and you can receive the questions, or the speakers, if they want to answer the questions. Thank you very much, Ziad. I know time was short to prepare the presentation. However, this is a very complicated case. And just to mention to our colleagues that this patient, when he presented to us, he was referred from Kuwait for possible uh, Tibbs, uh, he has uh, coagulopathy, his INR between 2.5 and 3. And even the hematologist, they did not want to start anticoagulant for him. And that indicated the, the patient is most likely having uh, advanced liver disease. And our uh, interventional radiologist preferred not to go for Tibbs since it will be something temporary and he definitely will need to go for tra transplantation. Fortunately, he, he went for transplantation. The father was the donor, although he has some post-transplant complication, but, uh, you know, uh, thrombosis is a well-known complication of inflammatory bowel disease. It is rare, in, in, in especially in children. Uh, however, you can see it. This patient also has uh, uh, sagittal sinus thrombosis uh, also, so he's not having thrombosis only in the in the in the hepatic veins, but he has thrombosis in the sagittal veins. And uh, post transplant, now he started on heparin with follow up with hematology. Uh, uh, we elected to present these two cases with ascites, since ascites is seldom discussed in, in such meetings with different aspect. One patient, a neonate who has ascites, chylus ascites, and he has 
you know, tuberous sclerosis associated with uh, lymphoangiomatosis. And he was successfully treated with sirolimus, which is a new modality of therapy in such patients. And this 13 years old who was referred from Kuwait, who had the chronic Bacchiari syndrome, who ended with uh, liver transplantation. I think we need to have uh, some questions. Uh, yeah, please. Please, for all participants, they can raise Dr. hands. And... Dr. Noah Ali, please. Yes, sir. Dr. Noah, the max is yours. If anybody had a question for the first or the second case. Dr. Noah, Rafa Abdul Khattab, Shri. There is two participants, raise hand, Dr. Hind and Dr. Noah. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Thank you very much uh, for the very nice uh, presentations uh, and well, uh, well presented as well. I just had one question about the second case where uh, he was uh, diagnosed with IBD. Uh, so uh, uh, was it, um, uh, was the disease severe or was he not uh, on... Uh, uh, not complying to medication. That's my first question. My second question is when you optimize the, uh, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, his medications after you di diagnosed him with uh, Bacciari, uh, uh, what was the regime that you, what was he on and what did you use? Uh, so to answer the first question, um... Uh, actually, he was diagnosed in 2017, and uh, unfortunately, the family was not uh, compliant, so they thought uh, maybe honey and habat uh, al-barka would help, and he didn't continue his medications. So he, even, he didn't even uh, revisit it again, the clinic in Kuwait. So uh, we're not sure about how the severe, how severe is the disease. And uh, we couldn't actually do for him any colonoscopy to assess his uh, severity due to his... Uh, uh, he wasn't stable actually at that point. He, the, he had uh, coagulopathy and uh, ascites. Uh, regarding the second question, they started him on initial management, with, which I think, uh, which I personally think uh, is good, with, which is uh, covering him with the anticoagulants and uh, trying to treat the underlying uh, cause, which is Crohn's disease. But unfortunately, again, the patient was not compliant and he came to us decompensated, already decompensated liver disease. So eventually he, uh, he required transplant, transplantation. I hope this answers your, your question. So he, he, has, he has a refractory arthritis to some extent that he was ventilated in the IC. We didn't go through the complicated course for the sake of time. Well, I can, he, he did not respond to whatever measures was given in Kuwait and even when he presented to, to our hospital. Any one more question maybe or two? Assalamu alaikum. Alaykum assalam yeah, uh, thank you for these interesting cases, Dr. Ali. Uh, would you like to start uh, anticoagulation uh, therapy for chronic cases of Bacchiari syndrome? Uh, this is uh, question number one. Question number two, what about JAK2 mutation uh, analysis for, for patients with uh, Bacchiari syndrome? Thank you. Dr. Ziad, can you want to answer or you can answer? 
uh, in all cases of bad care syndrome, if you're gonna, if you're gonna, if you think the, the patient is not decompensating, I mean, this is not decompensated liver disease and he doesn't require transplant and you're, uh, you're uh, perfectly managing, managing the complications of heart hypertension or any complications of chronic disease, uh, chronic liver disease. So I think he should be on long time or long life uh, treatment of uh, anticoagulants. Uh, regarding, uh, and also in addition to other maybe uh, modalities of treatment such as uh, maybe uh, angioplasty or stent if, if, the, if it's suitable for the patient. If not, you, you should al always consider uh, referring him for transplantation. Uh, regarding the second question, to be honest, I'm not uh, very familiar uh, about uh, JAK2. Dr. Ali, for the second question for Jack too, if you, if you want, you'd like to answer. It is, it is well known that these patients uh, uh, with inflammatory bowel disease, they are prone to develop uh, thrombotic phenomena. And uh, we did not uh, look for, you know, any other, you know, possibilities like Jack 2 or others. Even we usually do a lot of genetic testing, but we did not do anything for this child because we know this is a very well known association with inflammatory bowel disease. And uh, this patient, uh, uh, the, the major issue in this patient is the parents' belief, which was they were thinking of alternative medicine as a possible you know, treatment for his Crohn's or even for his butt cherry syndrome. Because when they, when they started him initially in Kuwait on, thrombolytic uh, uh, treatment, he improved. Then they stopped it. And when he came to us, he was in a very bad situation. He has a huge ascites. And when you drain him, then he goes into hypovolemia. He has impaired uh, renal function. So you need to have a, a very you know, narrow balance in order to keep the patient in the, in the, in the right tract. So, we had a very difficult time with, with these both two patients. Uh, the last one is more difficult because you know we reach a stage where he has, as she had mentioned, advanced liver disease. But this is to you know uh, uh, you know alert uh, you know the attendee that you know we see thrombotic embolism with this patient and don't take it light. You should take it very serious. Maybe Dr. Aif, you allow me one question for Dr. Abdaziz. For the genetic diagnosis for twist crosses, the, the first case, was it confirmed by genetic diagnosis or it's one of the cases that's negative for gene? Uh, for the first case, uh, actually, uh, genetic diagnosis was done. However, we saw, we saw it in the clinic after discharge. As you know, genetic might take some time. And it came, it came back actually positive for Jack, uh, for, uh, I'm sorry, tuberous cross complex type two mutation, which is the most uh, associated with uh, uh, chylus ascites and lymphatic malformation. So it came back positive, confirming the, the, the clinical criteria diagnosis. Okay. Uh, at the end, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ahmed for supervising this very nice presentation. Uh, many in the chat, they are thanking for the, uh, the presentation of King Faisal Specialist, Specialist Hospital. Uh, and I would like to thank the participants for their uh, interaction and uh, for uh, their uh, any, uh, questions and active participation. Uh, Dr. Dafer for sure, Dr. Muad for uh, the, as the head of the uh, SAS began. Uh, and because of the run of the time, and now it's almost 9.5 p.m., uh, uh, I, uh, I would conclude, and from uh, Dr. Dafer, uh, if you li would like to add anything or just uh, to uh, end this uh, very nice and uh, very hel helpful uh, cases. Uh, thank you so much for the organizations and thank for uh, the uh, presenting hospital, King Faisal, and thank you all. Nothing to add. Thank you so much. Thank you.